This session is brought to you by Zurich Life and Investments. These guys are one of the last true independent life insurers going around and they're Swiss, so you know their stuff is solid. These guys really understand and believe in the value of advice, which is why they invest in programs like this one and partner with groups like XY Advisor to help drive the positive evolution of financial advice in Australia. Their team are just really good people as well. So if you haven't already connected with them to learn more, check out their website or speak to your business development contact. This session is also brought to you by Sun Super. They're one of the fastest growing profit for members or industry funds in Australia. They were the very first of these funds to partner with advisors and they've got functionality where you can actually link to your client's Sun Super accounts and charge advice fees through the fund, as well as a number of uh, tech innovations to make it easier for you to work with your clients. They've got great investments, they're really, really cheap, and their team are just generally legends. So if you haven't already connected with Sun Super, give them a shout, because they're doing some really cool stuff. G'day, Chris Bates, what's happening? G'day, g'day. Um, Canopy, not called that anymore, are you? <laughs> now I've gone for a uh, easier, to pronounce name, not uh, Wealthful. Canopy? What's hard about that? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you gave up that name, man. It was so good. It was like the support, the canopy. It was like, oh, man, I wish I had a name like that. Mm. I mean, the new name must be phenomenal. Then It must really resonate if canopy isn't, isn't the first choice. It was canopy choice. private, by the way. It wasn't just canopy. Sorry, sorry. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Private yep. canopy, that's even better. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. It's, um, a, it's a funny thing, isn't it, with, with, when you're starting up a super fund? You actually want to look as as like old money as possible and then you start doing business and you're like you start backpedaling it oh shit what have i done yeah i about a year in i was like oh how do i drop this private bit and then <laughs> shit canopy.com oh sorry uh <laughs> canopy.com.au was taken i was like oh so i can't get rid of it yeah, yeah i did the same thing i was like i just drop the wealth and keep pivot my, <laughs> my guy told me to do pivot and i was like man you're insane you're crazy you're crazy man <laughs> uh and now i'm like fuck i wish i just called it um Pivot, but uh, I looked up the domain and it's owned by Incitec Pivot, the like multi billion dollar uh, fertilizer company. So, man, just mm. off from a couple of bucks. I've got it on back order on crazy domains, ten dollars nice. a year. So, you know, you know, maybe they'll let it slip. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, enough? apparently, google.com slipped. Did you guys hear about what? this? Oh, right. mm. oh man, and you this, could get some Google for a billion. This guy bought it. He used to work at Google and was this major nerd. And he found out that Google.com was available, bought it, and then like knew who to contact within Google. He's like, I just bought this for you. You might want to, you know. And I think they gave him like a thousand bucks. What? <laughs> oh man, I'd be I'd be holding that for ransom. <laughs> I did be. actually buy digitaladvice.com and Digital. then I went. Oh, and then I realized it got expired. And then I was like, told someone I owned it. And then I looked and went, actually, no, I've actually let it lapse. And then I quickly got in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, domains. I, I know a few people have made a couple of bucks off that kind of thing, but I think it's a lot sort of harder than it seems. Mm. I've just got heaps. I don't, don't really use them. Mm. I don't know. If, yeah. Well, especially now that there's dot... And there's about 50 to 100 oh, yeah. different yeah. things that you can... A lot of things. Yeah. So is it really worth it? But anyway, I digress. Mate, um, how's business? Very good. Yes. Cool. Yeah. No, it's, um, I've kind of got a pretty kind of refined offering now and i am kind of got my groove and, yeah, the LinkedIn stuff's going really well and, yeah, it's kind of all coming at me now, which is good. So that's the... Wow. That was the... I guess the dream, I guess I was trying to get to, and then it, it's, it's kind of coming at me now, so I'm not just posting twice a day, and, and they, they come, which is good. My God, what kind of uh, engagement are you getting these days? Uh, like 20,000 a post. Um, what? Yeah. 20,000 people see your posts? Yeah. <laughs> That's so awesome. It's amazing. Yeah. So I post twice a day, and generally it's 15, 20, sometimes 30, sometimes more. Yeah, so awesome. Yeah. What are you posting? Uh, it's all on there. That's a good thing about it. It's uh, <laughs> it's not hidden. Yeah, it's uh, it's all out there. I mean, it it just it varies. I mean, today's a lot of it's around property. I mean, I guess because I'm trying to be the person that people can go to for that. Mm. Um, I you know I guess it's it's do one on one on property that something hasn't people haven't thought about before, and then one maybe on life, just something that's. I think there's 
the part of where you know someone wants to know you and like you and want to seek your services out. That's what I'm trying to create. Mm. Um, so you got to get personal. You got to share things about yourself and share and open yourself up a bit. Mm. And so by doing that, people will either not like it, which is cool, but the people who do like it really like it. And then so then they're going to go well, actually. You know, I trust this guy. I want to. I wouldn't mm. mind speaking to him. And it's not rocket science, hey. It, no. it, it's just no one does it. Yeah, you did it. And I remember when you you said you were going to do it. You know, a couple of years ago, you go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build. I think my own brand, like use my name. And I remember thinking, well, that's ballsy. Like <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna actually do this thing that everyone talks about. And then fast forward a couple of years and here you are, I get 30,000 people looking at my posts. That seems insane. Yeah, I mean, it's 30,000 within the LinkedIn community. I have no other presence on any other platform. I don't think you need it. Do yeah. you need it? My God. 30,000 is mm. enough, I think. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what do you reckon about these people that, that get up people for, uh, for posting personal stuff on LinkedIn? So like weird, they talk, man. They talk about that's it like So that. weird. Just yeah. uh, block me if you, yeah. if you don't want to read it. Yeah. I mean, that's what I just, I mean, that's my view on it is if you don't like what I'm writing, then just block me. Uh, yeah. And but if you find it interesting, then keep reading, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, or, you know, lose the connection. That's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, everyone's got the choice of not following someone, so it, it's... Uh, totally. You're not, you're not forcing <laughs> it down anyone's throat. Yeah, that's not um, personal. It's not a... It's just something I'm sharing about me. It's If you find that offensive, then it yeah. says more about... The Can person. be offensive from time to time. It depends on which Chris Bates we're seeing, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you do? Did you well? Obviously, you did stuff to uh, to get that happening. But you know, what do you you have like a structured sort of strategy at the start, or like what did you? How did you approach it? So I started posting 2015 the start, and I would do long form. And at that point, I was only six months in the business, and I was thinking, you know, I guess I still had a few gripes with the industry and what I'd seen, and I kind of started off with a bit of a negative tone, and I think that was me just getting my thoughts out there really and once it was out then it was out you know and then so um i realized after about six months and thought well i've got rid of that now and you know now i actually just start posting about stuff i like and what i enjoy yeah and so cool. i just completely shifted and you know now it's just about it could be anything it could be animals or getting engaged or you know africa. you know inequality or africa or whatever mm. it might be um well-being you know whatever it might be mm. um Whatever's going through my brain, I'm actually, you know, interested in or that's what I post you, about. You, you, you sort of, uh, if I was to interpret what, what it is that you're, you do, in, some people blog and you kind of treat uh, LinkedIn status updates like a miniature blog almost. Yeah, I realise that the long-term blogs, I actually think I spoke to you on a Sunday once mm. and came around and uh, I just spent three hours writing a blog. Mm. And I'm like, I get 200 views for that, <laughs> and no one really clicks it. Mm. I've just spent all this time like this isn't really right. Yep. Um, and then I just started writing lots of short form, mm. and so I hit the word count limit, and then I kind of then have to kind of, you know, digest that a little bit and refine it. And but after you've done it, you know, hundreds of times, you kind of got a bit of a structure there, and you can easily just realize, you know, there's better ways to word things. Mm. But there is there is a bit of a, an art to it because. You know, really, it's kind of, you know, if someone can't read it properly or it's not articulated very well or it hasn't it hasn't actually got a solid point, then people aren't going to like it or they're not going to comment or they're not going to share or they're not going to read your next one. So you can't just post anything. It's just that you, it's just got to be quite short and snappy. People don't really read that much anyway, right? Like, so you're just flicking, 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 mm. read, read a little bit, flick, 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 flick. Yep. So you just want to kind of catch their attention and then... And you've normally got a picture as well, right? Picture's very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'll, I'll follow that. And so yeah. you, you get a, you're you getting a lot of shares on your on your stuff. Do you, uh, like, is there stuff that you're you're consciously doing to promote that? Or, like, yeah. Nothing at all, no. So I just post it and then, yeah, I never reach out to anyone. I never, even when I get asked for a friend request, I don't even say anything. I just, you know, we've connected. I don't need to give you this little line, Spiel. you know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And then you just follow me now. And then at some point in the future, 
if you like me and you need some help, hopefully you've seen me enough and you've read enough of what I think and you think, actually, that's someone I wouldn't mind. Yeah, you've nailed it, man, because developing a relationship with people at scale is uh, the whole point of the internet and the whole point, from a business point of view, and the whole point of social media is, is scalability, that two inch wide, two miles deep, you know, you, you know who you want to work with and you just put your authentic self out and it, everyone talks about it and then all these people that talk about it have like 50 followers on Twitter, right? Mm-hmm. And then you just actually stuck to it. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. It's awesome to see, man. So congrats, Thank first of all, to, to, to your self-discipline. Um, and dedication to, to making it happen. So, man, I'll and take my hat off. the amazing hair as well. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Shave the beard off. Could have given you a run. <laughs> hey, you still got a you still got a beard. Yeah, yeah, I've gone short. Yeah. Love. And so you were in Africa recently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was amazing. Uh, yeah, it's a cool trip. Where'd you go? Uh, Kenya, Uganda, just those two countries, just for about, about three and a half weeks. Um, yeah, it was amazing. It was. Massive animal lovers basically just spent the whole time admiring animals. <laughs> wow, man. That's pretty nice. cool, though. You see yeah. a zebra? So I lots and lots of zebras, yeah. Do you see awesome. a dead zebra getting Yeah, everyone's eaten? funny, though. Every time everyone sees the zebra the first time, they're like, oh, stop the bus, stop the bus. Yeah, and they get their camera out and, you know, oh, it's so beautiful. And, yeah. you know, they're waiting for the perfect shot. And then they go around the next corner and then there's another thousand zebras. <laughs> 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 totally. Was, it, was, it, was that sort of a... Um, is that the first time you've been to Africa? Uh, I've been to a bit of North Africa before, like Morocco and Egypt. And Is that when you used to live in London? Uh, one was, yeah, no, actually, yeah, once in London, once when I was here. Cool, man. Yeah. Do you have an affinity with Africa or? Hmm, I do. I actually thought I had one like years and years and years before I actually went. And uh, I was very close when I was living in the UK to when I was coming back. I was at this bit of a crossroads. I was like, do I go back to Australia? Or do I go to Africa and be a tour guide? Um, maybe for a few years. And I was like, had it all sussed out, had all the prices and spoke to all the different places and kind of sussed out all the flights and how it would all work. And I didn't push the button on it, to be honest. And so I moved back to Australia. So since then, I've kind of been, you know, it's kind of been grilling on me a little bit. Um, but I mean, that's kind of my first trip there and it won't be the, the last. Um, so tell us about this story where you nearly ended up in prison. Right. Um, yeah, so we did uh, lots of animal things over there. And like one, of the things, one of these things we did over there was on a private game reserve. Right. And uh, so basically you're walking in the wild. So you're walking in the wild. No car. No car. What? And there's, there's everything there. No lions, but there's, there's leopards. There's, Whoa. you know, everything's there. Do um, the leopards not eat people? No, but, like, leopards are very scared. Okay. They're very, like... Good. You know, they sit in a tree all day, they sleep, and then they attack at night. Okay. And so, like, you, you should be very unlikely to get killed by a leopard. Right. <laughs> More likely to get hit by a... But in case you did, you got worldwide income protection. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did actually check on travel insurance. So I was like, am I allowed to do safaris? Like eaten the by leopards. a leopard in the middle the of the night. <laughs> um, and, I mean, I guess about... That was like a four-hour walking, so we walked all right, all right around. We saw lots of different animals. It was amazing, and then came along this kind of warthog that, and warthogs are, you know, pumba. <laughs> they're actually like you think that there's actually lots of them out there. They're like a, you know, they're quite funny. But uh, I came across a, a carcass of one of those, mm. and because it's on a private game reserve, it's not like in a national park. It's a private thing. Mm. Um, and I looked at one of the tusks, and I was like, oh, this is amazing. Like this just feel the strength in this task. Mm. So I said to the guy, I was like, mate, do you mind if I take this? He goes, yeah, no, that's fine. Like, you can take it. It's, um, you know, it's our property. Mm. And I was like, cool, this is amazing. It's a proper tusk. whole tusk. You were yeah. going to make it into one of those necklaces and just with, like, the rough, like, the twine <laughs> yeah. or something. So straight I could in, straight see you rocking that. Straight in the caveman meeting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, do you want some income protection? <laughs> 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 and, uh, yeah, and so I, I, I was really fascinated by it. My girlfriend. Well, how big is it? Uh, like a, probably about 30 centimetres, yeah, but right. it's thick and it's strong and you well, can see why it would yeah. cause some damage, right? And so I was like fascinated. I was like, yep, yeah, cool. I'm going to take this home. Um, my girlfriend, now fiance, was like, no, no, no. Um, you know, I don't want you to take that. And I was like, no, no, I'm taking it. So I was in the suitcase and uh, we were flying back from, so we went right to the coast, I mean, a place called Mombasa. 
and uh, we're going through airport security and then got through the security and then the lady's like, uh, can you please come here? You've got animal products in your bag. Mm, what? And I'm like, yeah. And she goes, you know, that's illegal. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just a warthog. It's not a rhino. And I, sort of, and I said, it's a warthog. And she's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's an animal and it's completely uh, forbidden. And, you know, you can go to jail for that. Wow. And I'm like, oh, shit. And like I've just gone white, and uh, <laughs> my partner she's just like freaking out, like like tensing up, and I'm like I've got money, <laughs> and she's like, how much money you got? Oh shit, yes. And she goes, can you be, uh, can you give me? It was five thousand, five thousand Kenyan, and uh, which is like fifty US. Yeah. And I said I've got fifteen hundred. I said that's all I got, and she's like, nah, it needs to be more than that. <laughs> And the thing is, I only had 1500 Fuck. So it's not like I was lying. And I was like, I'm not lying. I'd give you 5000 but I've only got 1500 Yeah. And she's like, okay. <clears throat> and so I kind of like just dropped Deal. the cash on the table. Um, and what saved me was actually a big group of tourists kind of followed in. And because I had my bag out and it was like, she was like, oh, this is getting a bit too tight now. And yeah. I can cash in. I'll take my 1500 <laughs> My wow. goodness. Yeah, well, so, Smart uh, of you to suggest paying. Well, that's what you got to do. That wasn't the first time I had to, to really? uh, bribe. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, you have to kind of always have a separate, See, I, separate I did, wallet or something when you travel these countries. I didn't realise. Uh, like in South America, my passport was confiscated mm. because we were trying to get into uh, Paraguay, you know, in their defence, illegally. <laughs> <laughs> so we, di- we didn't have a visa, but we're like, nah, it should be right. Yeah. Um, and then, and then I, inst- I didn't realize that you just pay them. Mm. And so because I didn't realize it became this massive thing. Um, Should have just paid them. Yeah, just uh, had no follow idea. the system. Yeah. The wink and the nod and the, yeah. <laughs> mm. Oh, well, you, you got through, mate. Yeah. And so you sort of, uh, you mentioned something. I don't know if you just glossed over something there, but did, so was the knee bent while you were in Yes. Uh, oh, shit. Yes, I got, That's got, in, exciting, got engaged. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Definitely. Yes. Exciting times. Blood yeah. diamond or? Uh, <laughs> oh, brutal. <laughs> no, it was, um, I did knock her out almost on the way back up, but that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so I, was, give us... I was just getting up off one knee and then uh, she was bending down at the same time and, Clashed her, her chin into her face and uh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to engaged. She got life, she my got love. dizzy and she sat down and. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So, well, well, we've all then got engaged in the last six months. Oh, did you too? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and oh, Ben, yeah, and, congrats, yeah, yes. thank you, man. So it's uh, love fest. Look at love us, fest up in here. all growing up. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> when's the when's the big day? You made the plans or? Uh, we're gonna do it this year, but. Yeah, we want to do it. There's a, there's no venues down there, and b, it's just all too tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, next year. Okay. So you time, mate. Uh, August flying to Finland. Okay. Mm, yeah, right. yeah. And Benny's bloody getting it done real quick. My Fishing. my theory is uh, shotgun wedding. Nah, well, you'll see. Oh, you probably wouldn't be able to tell with Yang because she's so tiny anyway. But uh, no shotgun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what's uh, what's the plans for this year, Batesy? Uh, I mean, mainly it's just kind of. I mean, I've got I've got to a point now where the process is getting a thirty minute phone call at the start when we work. I guess. Do you charge for it? No, I don't. But I just. I guess I get a and I kind of dequalify them now before they get a chance to speak, and so I I, I kind of qualify them if they're they kind of qualify themselves, I guess. Right. And so and yeah, I mean they're coming to me, so. It's kind of, it's just really, I guess, managing that. That's really my challenge at the moment, really, is just... So your process like, is, uh, they f- see you on LinkedIn for a long enough period of time, they'll just shoot you an email. And get them straight on a call. And just say, let's just chat. Let's chat at three o'clock today if you can. Cool. Or, and then then get on the call and then just literally basically say, look, I only work with younger families mm-hmm. uh, and, and I've got two services, I offer them and then... Mm-hmm. You know, and then I basically kind of picture what the ideal client is mm-hmm. before I've known anything about them. Yeah, right. And then they either kind of say, well, that's not me or it is me, but most of the time it is. So 
Right, because of your LinkedIn work. Yeah, because mm. they've kind of already done enough pre-vetting themselves to think actually Chris is the one. Actually yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, that's mainly it. I've got to try to figure out how to, to, so I guess, move the business to a point where it's not so much me. I don't really want to, I guess. It's mm. kind of like that kind of dilemma of, you know, workloads in, but then how do I, do I get closer to where I want to go or, or is hiring and growing a business taking me away from that? So I'm a bit of a crossroads there, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, staff, tricky. Mm. And are you doing, uh, are you doing mainly mortgages or? Mainly a lot of it's around the property space, yeah. So it's kind of helping people to navigate the world of property. So a lot of it's life planning, so structuring around where they want to go with their life, which is, you know, getting helping them with those big decisions. And once we figure that out, we can start saying, well, if we want to get there, then you're going to need a home or maybe it's wise to invest. And this is kind of what you could do with property. And it's kind of, you know, a lot of it goes down that route. And, um, and, and you still use a lot of uh, uh, like buyer's agents? Oh, uh, yeah. I never – all buyer's agents, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Or they do it themselves, which is cool, but, you know, I've – I've got such a, a kind of process there that they at least speak to a buyer's agent. And when they do speak to a buyer's agent, you know, it's their opportunity to kind of demonstrate value and, yep. yeah, they decide to use a buyer's agent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not one buyer's agent. Like I've got five or so in Sydney that refer to me. I've got, mm. you know, many in different cities. So it's kind of like I refer them to three and then say, look, find one that really you match with and you click with and you actually feel like you can really talk to because it's quite an emotional journey. Um you're spending a lot of money, you're putting all your savings into something and mm. uh, you've got to be able to really talk to the person, I guess. That's awesome, man. Even if you're, even if the only thing you did was, uh, m you know, help people see the reality of the, uh, I, you, know, you could even use the word, the severity of the decision that they're making um, is, is such a powerful and valuable one. Most people just go, what's the max I can borrow? Uh, do a couple of open houses over yeah. a little bit of, you know, and then end up at a an auction perhaps and then spend more than they can. And yeah. and it's it's this entirely emotional process mm. with no guidance. And if someone's throwing around hundreds of thousands of dollars in this emotional, unplanned way, and then you can come along and be like, well, instead of doing that, pay me a couple of bucks We'll make sure you get a, a better result, better planned. I mean, I'm just mm. glad your service exists. Mm. Yeah. It's funny because uh, there was a new client yesterday and uh, she's like a head of content at a media mm. company. Right. And um, so she's been watching me on LinkedIn and then she's like, okay, cool. This guy's kind of good on content. Mm. Meet up with him. Yeah. And she's like, I don't, I said, it's funny meeting up with you because I'm actually really scared now. But I actually, I feel like I'm scared it for the right reason. I'm scared because I know that this is actually extremely risky now. And I've seen all the things that I was thinking about doing before was actually not the right decision. And I'm so glad I didn't do that. And now I know that I, when I do, do I'm kind of like excited but scared. Mm. And so she was, was that your approach? And I said, well, yeah, it is actually because... At least you've taken it you seriously. You actually need to, this is actually not just get any property you don't you can butcher this very quickly and, you know, and regret Absolutely, your decision. Absolutely, because the whole, like, from top to bottom, uh, I remember I was explaining to Vera not long ago of how and why people get into bad financial situations. I said it's because so many people on that chain are remunerated for you to make those mm -hmm. bad decisions. Um, it, it, which then leads me to this question. Do you get any, um, like, industry hate from oh. from property esque yes. people. Yes, and that's okay. Like, to be honest, like I think a lot of people are doing that because that's how they're getting paid and they're putting food on their table. Hmm. Um, is the vitriol? Can I just interject with another question? Is the vitriol hmm. of the uh, property market worse or better than the vitriol of the financial advisor market? Because <laughs> I feel like you're uniquely positioned to have experience. <laughs> Answer that <both>. question. <laughs> Uh, huh? Yeah, I mean, the financial advisor is the same. It's kind of fighting against your own people, isn't it? So yeah. uh, that's... Uh, it's that's, infighting. That's, it's that's, fine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, huh? Well, that's okay. You don't need to be friends with them. <laughs> uh, no, nah, I mean, the property are, are a rare breed and they're, um, there's so many different levels through the whole world of property where people are getting paid and they are recommending stuff that they shouldn't be recommending. Mm. And 
It's completely unregulated. That's why. So there's no one telling anyone from not allowed to do anything at all. And um, yeah, and so unfortunately, there's this. They get their view on it and they believe what they believe and they find it very hard to to hear someone who potentially put their whole business model at risk and yeah. So yeah, do you I mean, they actually believe it though because everyone like, has to, man. Every single person, no matter what they do in life, absolutely uh, qualifies themselves as being legit. You, you, it's so hard not to. It doesn't matter yeah. what you do in life, right? You could be the worst guy in the world, but you'll figure out a way to say, no, no, that, that totally makes sense. Yeah. I yeah. find, yeah, the, especially in the property space, and there are fantastic buyers agents out there. I'm sure the, the guys that you work with are all awesome, but there's just so many shonks and, and so much money as well. Like mm. that's the main reason I left the last company I was at because they were – you know, following this strategy that I was completely not aligned with and pulling in up to $40,000 commission selling, you know, 400 grand properties uh, in uh, in pockets of, you know, the country that, that didn't seem like that they had much, you know, <laughs> potential for long-term growth, you know, like, and there's yeah. nothing, no, people don't know until the end and then they're like, They've basically already committed at that point, you know. Like, well, yeah, you've got sunk cost bias. You've got, um, you know, there's so many behavioural biases involved with uh, getting it wrong, I guess. And I mean, you don't really want to loss loss aversion, you know, anchoring. You know, there's all these totally. things where, mm. you know, if you've bought something, you don't want to tell yourself even a year or even after you've signed the contract that that was a stupid decision because. That's not nice. Yeah, yeah and so most people won't. You basically then just go for confirmation bias, which is you just read stuff and you get people to validate what you're doing and to tell you what you're mm. doing is the right thing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's you, pretty scary. You should be the barefoot investor of property. Yeah. You know, and well, we we're, were just talking about that earlier. We went for lunch with Scott last, uh, last month. That was interesting. Did you? Yes. That's cool, man. <laughs> He's a good guy. Yeah? yeah. Uh, I've never spoken to him. Um, yeah, but because we were, me and Ben were talking about this earlier, um, that there's got to be a scalable way to do what you're doing. There has to be a low cost, scalable, digital, you know, for, for the people that don't want to, don't want your full service and the people that don't want to do nothing, mm. there is, there's a massive market there. Um, and I, I, I can't wait I, mm. for someone to come along and provide this. Yeah, we're doing one of these education. things actually. So, uh, oh, podcast yeah, with a buyer's agent, which is cool. Awesome. So that would be interesting. Well, that will work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you kind of got a. Well, what's the podcast you know, called? Uh, it's two different names. Property Minds is one. Yep. Uh, People and Property is the other. And because uh, we we don't want to be the typical, you know, Hobart has gone up twelve percent last year, and <laughs> you know, you should invest in Hobart or there's an oversupply <laughs> units in Brisbane. Like, this is just all boring stuff. We want to talk about the psychology and the behaviors behind the property market. Totally. And man. why are you even doing this? And why do you even care about doing it? And, you know, you, and what's how's FOMO affecting the market right now? And how's, uh, you know, the society pressure and all these sort of things? And how is this really affecting the market? And how is, how does this, how can you use these trends and these behavioral and demographics to make sure you're not getting affected by it, I guess? Yep. Um, even everything from bidding at an auction and understanding well what's at play and how do you bid and yeah and so yeah that's kind of interesting. Mate, cool. there's, there's, When's it coming out? Uh, we started it, so we've uh, we're looking at some different companies to kind of do all the managing stuff. Okay. Uh, a, a good mate of mine earns. Um, he's in the top tax bracket, so we'll put it that way. And he hasn't paid rent or any housing costs for four years. He lives in Western Australia and he loves to travel. Mm -hmm. um, so he, his style of work is uh, two weeks on, two weeks off, and he works on this uh, gas thing. Um, and he, when he's not working, he lives in his troopy, right? So he'll just surf and travel up the coast of Western Australia. Him and his fiance, who also does similar style of work. Oh, right. And they save 80, 80% of their money. <laughs> and the reason that they've done that is the counter, it, it's a definitely a counterculture to the ridiculousness of the property, uh, mm. you know, the current property uh, situation, that it's now seven times in Sydney or seven point something uh, times average family mm. household income 
insanity, right? And mm. so now you've got this opposite where he makes he makes bank, but he still doesn't want to spend a dime on it because he's so, so just, you know, he thinks the whole thing's bullshit. Mm. Yeah, you can definitely do that, I guess. It's, uh, and I think there will be a trend, I think, online and being able to work from wherever, anywhere, anytime. I mean, 5G internet will be another kind of enabler of doing stuff like that. I mean, people become the social pressure to actually sit in front of someone. You know, you just want to see someone who's actually quality, you know. You don't really care if they're sitting across the other yeah. side of the, the world as long as they're giving you good advice. That You don't really care if they're in front of you. You actually know how hard it is to find someone who's going to give you good advice. So if they're not there in front of you, you're still happy to get the advice. So I think, you know, and that's not just in financial advice. That's every industry. So why don't you live in wherever you want and still do it? Totally. So I think, do you um, have international clients to that end? I do actually. I've got quite a few different. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and so what? But they're Aussies, kind of living over overseas, right? So like Aussies in San Fran, Dubai, Hong Kong. But theoretically, if someone who an American who lived in San Fran, if they came to you, Uh, American living in San Fran, yeah, it's going to an Aussie advisor. Yeah. Uh, Well, why not? Well, I mean, you. A lot of the way they their tax laws and their investing. Oh, okay, so you right. go into so, that sort of tax piece, do you? Yeah, I mean, okay. well, just generally, yeah. Okay. I got a client the other day. Refer. I've got this client in Singapore who's an Aussie expat living there, and she referred me to one of her mates who's a Kiwi, and living in in Singapore. And we just start. We just started working together. Um, but yeah, not mm. not Aussie. I don't think you need. It, but you, obviously, an understanding of the tax system mm. works. But you can't do. Obviously, you can't do the actual technical planning, you know, for, for foreign jurisdiction tax mm. stuff. But um, but you can still do a lot of that, the coaching and the planning and the goal setting and the and the accountability. And like I've been working with with the, with a couple of guys offshore for for like years and or almost a couple of years, and it's it holds just the same. I think that there's so much in the accountability and the focus that you give mm. to to your clients when you're doing that overall sort of planning piece that um it's i'd argue that it's probably even more more than the technical side like that element Mm. of the 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 support that you give your clients is more than the technical yeah i mean i guess there's i think i'm probably going the other direction i'm kind of like this is exactly the type of client i want to work with and this is exactly what they're doing and this is exactly how much money they're earning and just trying to get 100 or 300 or 500 clients exactly the same as that yeah so i guess i'm trying to you know, if that kind of opportunity came up, it probably wouldn't, uh, yeah, excite me. You know what I mean? So I guess that's kind of where I'm at with it. Do you use Buffer or anything to post on LinkedIn or is it all you do it? No, wherever I am. So, right. yeah, every, wherever I am. So. Yeah, right, okay, cool. <laughs> so it's all l- yeah. largely on the spot. You need to yeah. diarize that. I know that I've got to do one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Yeah, okay. So if it's getting to like 11 and I haven't done it. What times? Know, uh, it doesn't matter. Well, I, I, it probably does matter if you looked at the data. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not going to yeah, figure out post at 11.22 or yeah, yeah, 7.45. Yeah, yeah. It probably is best to post at 5 and then, I don't know, 6.30 or 7 in the morning and you get them on the way to work and yep. get someone to read on the way home. But I think LinkedIn doesn't, algorithm doesn't even work like that anyway. I think it really just promotes content that you have liked in the past and content that you have stopped and read in the past. So... And then it says it promotes content that people generally like. And so, you know, you're always going to get, if you haven't posted before and no one's liked your stuff, well, it's going to be very hard to get engagement because no no one knows you and no one's read your stuff before. So LinkedIn kind of prioritizes people who are already writing stuff. Mm. So it is kind of inequality at its sure. at work. It's like a momentum. Mm. Yeah, I think I, I, I do actually, I spoke to a few people with LinkedIn, I do think it's a scoring system. And then it's like plus, plus, plus for every like or comment or... I mean, the Sydney, the, the office is just there. You could go up and ask them. Yeah, actually. Got a few clients there as well, actually. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> ben um, Ben did really well out of LinkedIn in the early days, didn't you, mate? Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah, I was probably a little uh, pushier than, than I should have, but it, it worked. It got uh, got results. Like I got, I got a bunch of clients out of that start. I wouldn't do it the same way now, but... I still connect with a bunch of people on LinkedIn and we get a ton of our traffic. Like I watch the traffic sources from our website, a lot of traffic from, uh, from, from LinkedIn, people see stuff and then they look at your profile and end up on your website. And 
end up on your, your mailing list and it's all just uh just commute like you know that's just where but you got to be where the people are right mm. it's an interesting so your your strategy is a little bit more old school in that get them on to your site capture the email then send them an email whereas yours is just bam in your face there's no sort of layers of separation yeah i'm just rich i mean to be frank it's just host and you know keep building a, a following i guess are and you- then you know, I, I think it's, you know, how I turn that following into something in the future. <clears throat> I, think, I think it's important. But, you know, I, I guess it's going to wait till that opportunity and I feel like the right thing comes up that I want to. I guess for me it's just, uh, you know, enough people coming to me on an ongoing basis now that that's cool. I, I've got the I've got the enough people coming and now it's a case of, you know, if I want to up the game then I've got to want to do it in a way that's scalable, I guess. Because uh, there's uh, no point getting 15 new inquiries and then going, well, I can't fulfil this. So, Well, yeah, yeah, good problem to have. Yeah. Um, the, the, the risk that's not unique to, to you at all, and a lot of people who built um, big Facebook pages can attest to this, and the best description I've heard this is people that build a, a good social following. And, I mean, XY Advisor Group is, is in the exact same situation is that you can create the most profitable McDonald's that's sitting on top of a volcano. And so at any point, that can be taken away from you uh, if, you're, if you're reliant on that platform. So, so that's happened twice. Oh, wait, to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No way. So I've been banned on LinkedIn twice. Um, banned? Well, not banned, but disengaged, turned, oh, yeah. off, turned off. How does that so, happen? So... Um, shadow band or whatever yeah so basically you can get a restriction on your profile and yeah you can basically kind of yes I mean I one I was I did a blog post on Melbourne and I hadn't done this before and this is why I set off a limit the Sydney one went quite viral like it was over a thousand likes and so then I went through and then all the people who liked it I kind of connected with and then I thought well if they've liked the Sydney one I'll send them the Melbourne one and it was all around developments and then I hit like a, a message account limit. Right. And so then they like blocked me. And then so I had to go into LinkedIn, like into their office in my oh, place. What? I'm like, I'm not leaving till I kind of get removed. It's like, and um, yeah. And then this guy came in. He goes, look, mate, this is what's happened. And he said, yeah, no worries. I'll get rid of it. It's fine. And did you then pitch him your service and he became a client? <laughs> is that it, the clients yeah. that you were talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny though, because I got his email address. And then I literally... Uh, no, like a year later, I um, so the LinkedIn did do this stupid thing where after you add connections, it sometimes says, do you want to connect to oh, every yeah, single yeah. person you know? Yeah, yeah. So this is like 2,000 people. And I must have been just, I don't even remember doing it. And then yeah. all of a sudden, it's like your LinkedIn's, you've hit connection request limit because <laughs> you've just asked 2,000 people I don't even know. Wait, I've never noticed this. So when you connect with someone on LinkedIn, it can say, do you want to connect with everyone they know? Everyone you know. And no, no, no. It's like databases of just, and it's just people you don't even know. So it's, it's like your email. It's like your all oh. your emails. That is, I don't know where it gets them from. Maybe it's like Gmail or something. But there's like a big list of like, do you want to connect with all of your contacts or do you want to invite them all or mm. something? Yeah, and it's like 2,000 like, people usually or I don't know how many it is. Yeah, it'd be a lot Probably, if it was all then, the people you've emailed. Yeah, all the, even people you haven't been emailed before or off lists and I don't know how it got it but anyway two and a half thousand re- connection requests went out <laughs> and then it's like obviously you're spamming LinkedIn so it's like block me and uh, from their own well, it's from their own little button and I'm like look oh, this is stupid my. I didn't obviously mean to push this button and now you've blocked me <laughs> because of your silly kind of so system you, ha- you had to go back to the office so I emailed the guy that actually got me off last time I was like mate I had another issue <laughs> and uh, yeah well, we got off it the second time as well which was cool but wow. yeah, no, but that's that's when that that is kind of gut wrenching, right? Because it's yeah. that you know that's the volcano going off, and you're like, well, that is my one source, and mm. you do turn that off. Mm. Like you do need to diversify, but you know, I'm just hoping the volcano doesn't blow up. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> great, that, great risk mitigation strategy there. <laughs> nah, <laughs> that happened to me with my with my email list that I had my I don't know what it was something with my website that I didn't have like a you know, you click the box to say that you're, um, you're a human, you're a human person. Cause there's all these Capture. forms that, yeah, there's all these forms on my website to, to like download some things. And 
I could see that my list was growing. And I, at the start, I thought, oh, this is amazing. And then I looked into it more and I noticed that it's just like downloading every single thing off my website all at once. And like, nobody does that. As much as I'd like to think that they do when I create all of this awesome, awesome, in my mind, content. Mm, I, um, did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that, but that's different. That's just like, you know, IP theft. That's a different, that's a different thing. Um, but, but yeah, and then I noticed, so I started like penning these people into a list and then deleting them out every few days and stuff. But then I found that, I found out that they, I don't know, you still don't really understand it, but it was like some of the email addresses were real, but it wasn't that person that was adding mm. their email. So it must've been like a spam bot or like a, mm. they, they have these farms apparently where they do things and, uh, they blocked my thing because there was too many people were saying that the emails were spam. Oh no! Like unsubscribing and reporting spam, and it's like I'd never, I've never, even when I was doing my salesy stuff on LinkedIn, I never took anyone's email from LinkedIn mm. without their permission. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I freaked when I did it because I got all these like automations in my email thing, and there's like different things for our workshops and our content, and there's pipelines and funnels and shit. And uh, yeah, I was I was freaking. I was like the almost abused. I'm pretty sure it was a chatbot, so I probably didn't make much of a difference. But from the, <laughs> from the active campaign, <laughs> very <people>. complex. <laughs> What's going on? This is my business. It's not me. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, result. Well, what, what a weird technology. what a weird thing that they're using spamming other people. I just don't get it. Like, yeah, mm. no idea. So they said something about because we take payments online through the website, so it might have been they're trying to exploit the thing somehow or mm. something about the internet. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Something. Yeah, no idea, no spam. idea. So, yeah. um, what I gotta ask? What's going on? Where, how come you caught up with Scott? Scott? Yeah, ah. he's like he's like, he's he sold half a million books. Half a million books, thirty bucks a pop. Mm. Did the numbers? Yeah, he's done well. That's a lot of books. Yeah. Um, so you sold that amount of books. Bef- you could probably sell that amount of books again. Yeah. Uh, so I think he's doing another book, and yeah. Which, and, and, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, no, he's, he's doing a, I mean, I think he's probably put it out there as well as helping kids and uh, parents with kids, which would be pretty cool. Very um, cool. Yeah, no, no, it's, uh, he's definitely, his heart's in the right place. I guess it's, uh, obviously a lot of people probably don't think it is, but, you know, his stuff's good. People talk about it. He's doing more for, I guess, people getting uh, into financial, into financial knowledge, I guess. Yeah. Um, making it cool, making it sexy, yeah. making it digestible and fun and, Definitely. You know, if, if people can talk about that and not be, you know, embarrassed to read that on a train. Yeah. Um, like, it's cool. People have it on their, you know, went around my best mate's house in um, Newcastle on the weekend. He's just moved into a new place. He's a client of mine, actually, as well. And, you know, he's got he's got it there sitting on his, you know, in his, you know, his bedside table. Yeah, that's and awesome. And I was like, yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, no, he's a good guy. He's, um, yeah. So cool. we just, uh, we just, I, I guess why we catch up is, uh, he likes what I write. I like what he writes. And yeah. Yeah, it's just a mutual kind of thing. And yeah, we caught up. That's awesome. Next time you speak to him, we tell him we'd love to have him on the podcast. Scott, yeah. For sure. Definitely. I think he's got another kid on his way. Oh, cool. So, so you've, moved, you've, <laughs> you've moved from the, you've moved into the positive side of advice, right? Mm. And, and, and what appeals to you? Um, do you still get hate mail? No. <laughs> no. I, I get, I get, um. I do have to use the blocking feature on LinkedIn. <laughs> do you? Um, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not ashamed to use it, to be honest. I give people a few strikes and, uh, yeah, and I, I think... Like comments, people are getting on their commenting. Yeah, and if, if the comments sometimes get personal or sometimes they just, just they're obviously upset about something mm. and, you know, they're firing away at their, their computer and they do it once, it's like, yep, cool. If they do it again, do it three times, it's like, no, nah, I don't need this. Really? Then. Yeah. You, you let them go on. Well, I'll give him a couple of strikes. You know, everyone can have a bad day, right? So, Tim you know, Ferriss doesn't. I was yeah. listening to a podcast the other day, and uh, one of his, and he said, if someone gets on, like, if, if I invite you into my house, you know, you come in, you just stick your feet up on the bloody couch, right? Your dirty shoes. He has it's out. He, mm. And he said, no strikes. Gone mm. straight away. I think if they go personal or they offensive, yeah. then I just like, well, there's no time for this. I mean, we're on a, you know, professional forum and you're kind of, you know, I think it's not looking good for them either. They shouldn't be doing it. It's like, totally. like you probably heard yeah. more damage to yourself. Um, yeah, and I mean, yeah, I guess it's once it's once they're out of your life, then you never see them again. And um, so uh, I, I do think it's a, 
It's a good feature for not just life, not just LinkedIn, but life. <laughs> Tell them, yeah. <laughs> Blocked. <laughs> um, you said you had two services yeah. in your business. Can you talk about that? Uh, I call the first one the property plan, which is the way I like to articulate it is helping people navigate the world of property and to when they come to me and they're thinking about doing something related to property. So they're already coming in the saying, Chris, we're looking to buy a first home. And so, or I'm looking to upgrade or renovate or uh, buy an investment property or whatever it might be. Mm. And we take a few steps back and we think, well, is this something that you should even do in the first place? So is cool. this really, you know, why are you doing it? Or where do you want your life to go? So it moves into what I call life planning advice. It's not financial advice. It's it's figuring out where they want their life to go. And, and that's we, inside your property plan. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So this is the first step is actually figuring whether they should do it or not. Awesome. And I mean, even... Like, say, the, for example, the client this morning, like, she's not ready, right? She's not ready to do it. And if she does do it, she needs to make sure that, um, you know, she's actually, uh, yeah, I mean, her, her future wife, I guess. So, and, um, you know, I guess figuring out where they want to live and, you know, so it's kind of like you shouldn't not just do it because you feel like you should do it. Let's figure out making sure what you do now is a stepping stone into where you want to go. Totally. And so that's the first thing. That's the property plan. Then we go through, okay, well, if you are going to do it, what's the right approach? So we look at all the different kind of options out there and the type of properties and the, and the borrowing capacity and the lending. And, and then we figure out what type of asset might suit them. So it might be, okay, well, we've got a budget of 700. Maybe you could get something good in Brisbane or maybe you could get a, you know, top quality one better in, you know, et cetera. And then Blacktail. we start, Yeah, maybe. <laughs> no, you're surprised actually. I just found one this morning in Edgecliff, one bed. Bathroom, car parking, hundred meters from the station with a courtyard. How much? Seven hundred grand. Yeah, nice. Whoa. Yeah. That's so there's these little kind of nuggets out there, right? Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess it's talking them through that. Then we introduce them to buyers agents, get them pre-approved, and then I just handhold them through that whole journey, make sure they don't really make a mistake anywhere with their property decision. Um, and then there's something I call wealth coaching, where you know that's not enough, right? That's we need more than that. We need to talk about more than the property. We need to talk about everything else that's going on. Um, if they've just got a property and they've got some debt, really what they should really be doing is just saving again, right? You need to go from no, like from cash to no cash. You need cash again. So mm. your focus should be now saving for most people, right? So I don't need to be charging them for that. So mm. I just give them a, a saving goal. Um, but if it's wealth coaching, then we look at absolutely everything in their life and we start to say, well, you know, what are you doing in your super? What are you doing diversifying you, you know, et cetera. So... Mm. That's kind of where that service fits in. Right. So with your with the property plan, do mm. you do you go right into the numbers in terms of like financial modeling of different, you know, properties? No, and I, I, and I talk very high level and, and very – because it's all variables, right? And that's what the problem with modeling is it's done on uh, linear growth and things don't work in, in you know, in straight lines. So yeah. um, modeling – to me, is a little bit pointless, really. It's 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 f a bit fictitious, really. I mean, I guess. Yeah, I never got into it as an advisor. I never did one model once. I did, and I probably did believe in it. But I kind of the more I look at it, the more I realise it's it's what you're really wanting to do is just get people to move forward, and mm. you know. Yes. And the whole purpose of modelling is to to sell a gap. You need three. You've got two. You need to make up the other million bucks, and to do that, you need to save and invest and. I don't think that you need the model to do that. Mm. Um, and modeling growth and different, you know, assets, it's it's kind of, you know, fundamentally it's it's the property that goes up the most that, that matters really because mm -hmm. um, that drives future yield. It does all this. So really it's just about getting a quality asset um, yeah. rather than... But you do, how do you help them though to make the, you know, the right decision around the numbers? Like how do they know that 700 is the right amount to spend? So you've got to match the purchase price to the market so if you're trying to buy so for example you know there's no point trying to buy one bird or in sydney at 600 because you're going to get absolutely nothing no no no. i mean for the individual how do you know that 700 is the right thing for them to spend not like what do you buy with the 700 so it's usually not a decision on uh what's the right amount for them to spend it usually comes down to their capacity and their savings uh -huh. so you know, if you've got the – not many people have got the ability to go spend $2 million. They're always going to cap yeah. out at some point. Yeah, yeah. And then it's about saying, well, you know, if this is a home or it's a future investment, like, you know, do you go for the one really top quality asset? Like, do you buy a house in Melbourne, you know, four coach from the city um, and spend a million bucks? Or, you know, do you spend 700 leave a bit more capacity for your next house 
And so it's just kind of those trade-offs, I guess. And how did they choose then 700 or a million? Well, it depends on their think? future, right? So, I mean, if, if their future is going to be, uh, their serviceability is going to be capped, then spending a million bucks and then might not allow them to go buy a home in three years' time. Oh, yeah. I so see. to de-risk yeah, themselves yeah. from that, they could go, well, let's not, even though we could buy something at a million, let's buy yeah. something at 700. Uh, servicing, you've, uh, you've got to be playing the servicing game smartly now because it's reducing dramatically. So, yeah. and even this oh, week, yeah. APRA has basically kind of talked about it and it's going to... You can't use the tax deduction benefits, right, of negative gearing in, in the calculations. Yeah, that's been about six months, yeah. Mm. And then they've come out again this week and they're basically targeting investor loans even more and it's... So in the UK, it's four and a half times here. You're getting six, seven, eight, nine times salary. In the UK, it's four and a half. So it's like... It's you know, crazy. You can see what they're with it in what direction they're going to go. Yeah. Um, changed, changed heaps as well. Like I noticed that even just like the last... The last 12 months, like 12 months ago when I was helping people with their plans, it was like significantly easier for them to, to be able to afford, you know, go buy a place, 800, 900, whack it on interest only, 4%, no problem. Yeah. Um, like still they had buffers and stuff caught in, but even, but now it's like, it's much more difficult to do that. And I suppose it's, it's, uh, you know, quite concerning with given the amount of people that have done that in the last five years with those, you know, those uh, periods expiring over the next five. Yeah, five. that's the biggest risk I think out there is the interest only cliff, which I've been saying for a while. Basically, they're not going to be able to refinance um, and the, the the lender is not allowed to roll over interest only anymore. They're like literally, I'm pretty sure they're not allowed to do it. Got to reapply, right? Yeah. And yeah. so it's before they just roll it over for another five, but now they're not allowed to do it and you've got a service. And so... It's it's not going to happen for a lot of people, and mm. then when your repayments jump from four percent on a million bucks is forty grand a year, but then now you've got to pay off a million dollar loan over for twenty five years. Yeah, it's a significant. Yeah, interest. you're probably going to double your repayments. So, um, yeah, that's kind of going to be a big drag on the market. I think cash outs the next the biggest thing they're targeting now as well. Like before, you could just take out your equity, put it in the bank, you know, offset, and then go again as soon as you get more equity, you just keep getting cash out. You can't get cash out anymore. Can't you? No, it's Good. pretty much just... I can't believe they called it... There's the best PR ever, calling it equity. Yeah. Equity. No, no, no. You're getting a loan. <laughs> You're going into debt. Yeah. That, that, that's not equity. Yeah. Oh, goodness yeah. gracious. It's, um, yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. It's going to slow down the property market, definitely. Credit growth is what the number one thing is what drives the property market. If, if banks can't lend or banks are able to lend, people are going to borrow, you know. So mm. if, if you restrict credit growth, you're going to restrict pro property prices. So what's happening now is we are seeing credit growth or the opportunity for people is keeps on getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So that is going to lead to, you know, a slowdown in the property market um, long term as well. Do what you it think will, it will bubble? Like a GDP uh, burst? I wouldn't buy down? any... Or hold any property that's in an area where it's where investors buy. So it's not where homeowners buy. Mm -hmm. Because investors at the moment are on full throttle and they're kind of taking their foot off the gas now because they're like, I've got to pay a million bucks for this really poor asset now. Um, and interest rates have gone up for investors. So they're already slowing down. But for the last five years, they've, they've been on, you know, everyone who could invest has invested. And now in the future, they're not going to. Um and so any area where investors, if the investor market has to get out of the market, which it kind of is, and then in these markets as well, there's usually supply issues. So it's kind of new units, it's kind of new townhouses. Um, yeah, you've got an increase in supply and a huge drop in demand. It's, it wouldn't be pretty. Mm. So you've got to be in areas where established housing, where families want to live, because that's the owner-occupied market. And, you, and that market, demand just for that every year gets bigger because if, as soon as you're 18, you go to the city, you get your university degree, at 25, 30 or 35, you get engaged. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then you you want to have a house, right? And so you can't leave the city because that's where work is and your family are. And so the demand for housing just keeps growing and people, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the big difference. Mm. Well, mate, Thank you, first of all, from uh, the financial planning point of view in, in that creating this service and, and you know, creating a really uh, individual um, and unique service offering. I think it's awesome. Um, is, can, if, 
if you start the pod, well, when you start the pod, podcast, when it released, please let us know because I think that's really going to be really valuable to financial planning uh, community. Um, and mate, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks, lads. Cheers. Cheers Chris. Bye, guys. <laughs>